Welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Hey, this is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Aaron in my closet in Dallas, Texas. Aaron! <laughs> We were both about to say it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it. I was waiting. How's it going, Erin? <laughs> Welcome to our closet. Thank you. We are yes, so happy to have you. Yes, we happy are. to be here. I'm very excited. Erin was the winner of our anniversary, I'm sorry, birthday contest. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Let me change that because Beth so pointed out to me that we are not married, so it's not our anniversary. <laughs> We kind of are, but it's fine. (laughs) Anyway, Erin won our contest that we had. um, When was that? A couple weeks ago, actually? Yeah. I don't even remember. And uh, we are super excited to have her here. And she also happens to be my husband's cousin. It was not fixed. Swear to God, it happened legitimately. (laughs) So um, it's super exciting that we actually get to talk to somebody that one of us at least knows. It is true. We were nervous about who <laughs> was going to win. <laughs> I'm not going to lie about that. I mean, we would have been so excited for anybody, but when we were like, oh, we know her. Cool, cool. <laughs> 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 it's going to be great. <laughs> and Thanks for having me. I really want to know what topic did you pick? Family Annihilators is the one that won. We had four topics to choose from. We had Family Annihilators, Kid Murderers, Murders by Poison, and... Famous Murders. Famous Murders. I think I picked Kid Murders. Okay. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I did not win, but you did. (laughs) Well, I plan to do one of those. That's why you I wanted to on the list because I have actually a couple of those on my list to do. Well, bless your heart. Well, you always go dark. Well, we'll get there eventually, just not this episode. <laughs> okay. Family Annihilators is the That's winner. dark. Too. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a hard time with it. Did you? Um, yes. Yes, because it just seems senseless no matter which one I went towards. And I am not doing Chris Watts. <laughs> Neither am I. Good. I hate him. Or Scott Peterson. I feel like that would have been combining two of the topics because they were both kind of famous. So I wanted to see. Yeah, from, those are well known. Yeah. They are. We, and you're right. We don't like to, I mean, not that we haven't and not that we won't, but we tend to stay away from the like super, super well known ones. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I mean, I feel like famous murders is like JFK. Like, that's what I think of is like murder people who were murdered that were famous. Mm, okay. That's how I that's read that one. Glad that went in a different way. When? Because we would have. <laughs> well, I think we would have talked about it before. <laughs> Make sure we were on the same page. Okay. But maybe not. <laughs> anyway. So. Okay. All right. Well, you got anything? I mean, we're this is our birthday episode. So we're one. Yay for us. We're one. Technically, Ooh. not till tomorrow. Right, the 30th, but. And we have a merch code. (laughs) Oh, yes, we do. Birthday merch code. So if you go to our merch site, you can get a merch code or a discount. (laughs) It's fine. You're going to get a discount, but you're going to have to check social media for that code this week because one, we just don't want to tell you. Two, we haven't come up with the code yet. We forgot. Can it be Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should do that. <laughs> How much, what percentage are we giving off? <laughs> I mean, I think like what? 10, 15, what do you say, Aaron? <laughs> 15, 20%? I don't know. Well, should we go in the middle and say 17? Say, oh, there you go. <laughs> Aaron, 17. <laughs> Aaron 17 will be the code. All right, sweet. So check social media for that again as a reminder and go buy some merch for our birthday. Please. <laughs> any I got anything else? Got any other craziness? That's all I got. What, do you have anything, Aaron? Do you have any news for your week? Tell us about your day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Got the hair colored this evening. I gray. actually was going to bring up your fabulous hair. 
Uh, she straightened it for me too. It's normally curly. It is the most beautiful color. I wish you guys could see it. She is a bombshell happening right now. And I look like somebody dragged me through a car wash. <laughs> well, and I'm growing out my gray. So we were we were on opposite ends. <laughs> yeah, like, I have a I have a lot of gray hair. I think I would be almost I think I would be 60% silver. I think that's beautiful though. Yeah. Mm. I think at some point I'll have to just go gray. And I've looked at a few hairstyles that are pretty trendy with gray hair with like almost like gray, like dark gray hair with light gray highlights. Yes. Hmm. Looks really good. I agree. Ombre gray. I'm going to have to tap you for those soon when this grows out. And that's what I'm looking like. Wait, so then are you going to dye your hair gray? Yeah. (laughs) I I think I would have to because then at that point you have to cover up what's left of the brown. It's true, man. There's It's so hard to be a girl. Yes. (laughs) Even if you stop dyeing your hair, you have to dye your hair. Oh, gosh. Seriously? What do you guys I thought I was giving it up so I didn't have to do it anymore. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Like, even if you want it to be like a pretty gray, you'd have to like dye it that. You can't just like be who you are. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be who I am. And then you guys can I'm tell good. me how I'm glad. <laughs> Could you, you just need to pave the way. <laughs> I do not want to die. I'm growing it out. So I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> I hate coloring my hair. It's my, I don't like doing it myself and I don't like getting it done. Yeah. Same. Same. That's why I I'm absolutely hate it anymore. I've never dyed my hair, but it's common. And I will be like you, Erin. I will go and I will dye it until like the bitter freaking end. <laughs> I don't want to have gray hair, I don't think. I mean, at this time, maybe after I've been dyeing it for five, seven years, I'll get sick of it and feel like I do want to. But after you hit 40, <laughs> that's like tomorrow. I know. <laughs> this year, I'll be 40 this year. Exactly. I'm okay with it. Okay. Not gonna dye my hair. Good, go for it. You're lucky you don't have gray already. I've been gray since I was like 30 years old. Well, no, I have some. I mean, it's bad lighting, but I definitely have some gray hair. But my hairdresser says I have to be 15 percent gray before she'll touch me. So, mm. oh, right. shout out Liz. She listens. Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah, way to go. <laughs> <laughs> she always makes me feel better. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's what hairdressers are supposed to do. Exactly. Do you have any um, crime for me, Miss Christy? Do you want to go first? That's my do make us feel good. I mean, we both have stories tonight, so uh, I, I can go first. Okay. And this, yeah, won't make you feel good. It may make you, I don't know. Hopefully, it doesn't make you want to do what this guy did. But anyway, I chose the story because it's a there's a connection to New York, actually. I have no recollection of this case because I had already moved out of New York when it happened, but it's the story of the Parente. I think that's how you say it, family. Have you guys heard of that name? Nope. Okay, good. Well, William Parente was born in 1949 in Brooklyn, New York, and he grew up as an only child to Willie and Rockalin Parente. I like that name. Isn't that different? Are they Italian? Parente sounds like it. Guessing. Yes. Very Italian. (laughs) Just wanted to verify. They would vacation in the summer in Long Beach, which is on Long Island. And it's about a 25 minute drive from where they were, but probably a pretty common vacation spot for the city people because, you know, Brooklyn's kind of considered that area. And William would graduate from Brooklyn College and Brooklyn Law School. He met and married Betty Mazzarella. That's not Italian. (laughs) <laughs> it's almost it's basically spelled mozzarella but with an a i was gonna say i definitely want to eat her like baked spaghetti <laughs> yeah, right exactly so he met her in 1977 well met and married her in 1977 there's not a whole lot of information about um betty beforehand william became a member of the new york state bar and joined a wall street partnership Sometime late 1988, William and Betty learned that they were pregnant with their first child. And so they made the decision, or he made the decision to change and move into a private practice and start his own. And they moved to Garden City, New York, which again is on Long Island, and where Betty was actually originally from. 
and a side note on that one, uh, my first teaching position was in Garden City, so I know exactly where this is. How big is Long Island? That's pretty big. I don't imagine it in my head to be big. Is that stupid? <laughs> I mean, it's long. It's really long. It's not very like called West Long West. Island. Got it. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> yes. But I live like in the center of it and it could take like a couple, two to three hours, probably like two Whoa. to get to the one end of it. And then it took me an hour to get to the city if we drove. I mean, to Manhattan. So, wow. Yeah. So it's it's pretty long. Got it. So um, they welcomed Stephanie. There's lots of names that are familiar in our family here. To um, Into the world on August 3rd, 1989. And then on October 24th, 1997, they welcomed their second daughter, Catherine, into the world. Betty was a stay-at-home mom. She was a class mom in her daughter's classrooms, and she was just devoted to them. She was also involved in many other organizations as well. She volunteered on the board of Tri-Town Auxiliary of the United Cerebral Palsy and for the Girl Scouts of Nassau County. I lived in Nassau County. <laughs> the American Cancer Society, and she was on the PTA. I mean. Ugh, busy, busy. Bless yeah. your heart. Yeah. I'm, mm -mm. The PTA. I, I volunteer. <laughs> Yeah. No, I refuse. I refuse. I don't even go to meetings. <laughs> like, oh my God. Can't. No. You don't want to be anything with those people. No. <laughs> Although I do have some good friends that are very involved, but I just refuse to do it. Refuse. Well, it's good that you have allies. That's true. That's true. Anyway. Well, Betty was Betty was on there. Um, she also served as a Eucharistic minister at the St. Joseph's Church. I tried to look St. Joseph's. There's like 50 of them. So I have no idea which one she was at, but she was – she worked. She was a Eucharistic minister at one of them. Okay. What is that? It's the person who gives out the communion or one of the people. Oh. That gives out the communion. Yeah. I don't know that. I'm not Catholic. Oh. I grew up Catholic. Yes. My my grandfather was one. I, I mean, I'm sure there's several people in my family that were – my dad was an altar boy. Wanted to be a priest. Can you believe that? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But I was anyway. still picture an altar boy in my head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So the family would frequently go back to Brooklyn to visit with William's friends and family, including going trick-or-treating with his daughters every single year. They went back to his little home like neighborhood and what that he went trick or treating growing up. So that was it's kind of cool. I think I feel like New Yorkers are just kind of like that. They're very attached to I'm not that I'm saying other families aren't, but I feel like it's more so there. They are very connected with their neighborhoods and communities and whatnot. And they don't like to leave their family for very far. Except me. I get out. <laughs> anyway. Which your parents did too, so Eventually. <laughs> it took him two tries, though. Oh. <laughs> um, William had built a respectable ret reputation throughout his career. He was a tax lawyer. He had an office in Manhattan, and according to other attorneys, he was a hardworking family man. He was always polite to his long-term secretary and worked long hours, but not considered to be, like, excessive. He wasn't never home. He he would go home. He just would work some long hours. He rarely cursed or joined in on the occasional drink after work. He rarely wow. cursed. That was in the reports. Yeah. Wow. That was in okay. one of the news reports, yes. So, I mean, I felt like I had a – but he did, also didn't go out for drinks after work. Who does that? Huh. Anyway. Over the years, the family managed to acquire a million-dollar home in Garden City, a West Hampton oh. condo that was worth about $250,000, and William drove a Mercedes-Benz, if that means anything to anybody. In April of 2009, their oldest daughter, Stephanie, was a sophomore in college, and she was studying to be a speech-language pathologist at Loyola University in Baltimore, Maryland. Catherine was 11 years old and in the sixth grade, and the family decided to take a trip to Maryland on Wednesday, April 15th, tax day. How did the tax lawyer leave on tax day? All right. Okay. Um. They went to surprise Stephanie. They weren't. They didn't tell her that she they were coming, and they stayed at the Sheridan Baltimore North in Towson, Maryland, which is just outside of Baltimore. I don't know if you guys are familiar with. Yeah. Well, you're familiar with Maryland, Beth, right? Yes, my husband's from Maryland. Yeah. 
So they were supposed to head home on Monday, April 20th. But on the 20th, they failed to check out of their hotel. And so the hotel staff knocked on the door several times to check in on them, but they didn't answer. So the hotel manager then, and they, I say in quotes, broke into the room because I'm not really sure that you are breaking in, but I guess because you're going in without permission, they consider it breaking in. Or it could have been that they, you know, the lock that you can turn in a hotel room that you can't access from the outside when you're inside, it could have been. Oh, that's true. I didn't even think about that, that he would have to somehow, yeah, get that open. Yeah. Or the the one that flips over too, that you can't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that true. chain lock kind yeah. of contraption. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, so he had to break in, the manager. Um, and when he opened the door, he saw a lifeless body on the floor just inside the entryway that was kind of coming out of the bathroom. He, and he immediately left and called 911. He was sure that whoever it was was not alive. So the police arrive just to enter the room, not only to find William Parente dead on the floor in the entranceway, but also Betty, Catherine, and Stephanie were all dead, lying side by side in the king bed, clearly placed there because their blankets were just lifted, you know, up to their chins, and they're just laying side by side. Yeah. Why did they decide that they needed to break in? That seems dramatic. It's like, well, nobody's heard from them. Let's just break in. Right. So, well, I know because I was thinking that actually too, because right, like currently if we go stay at a hotel, we don't actually check out. Like we just leave, <laughs> you know, like I don't stop by the front desk and say, no, I, hey, they put leaving. something under your door. Right. And you know, you just assume, but I guess, I don't know. I mean, but there was a time where you had to go to the front desk and say like, I'm leaving and here's my key. Check out. Right. And get your, so you I don't know for your stuff. Right. Right. And all that. So I don't know if this was, I mean, I say 2009. I feel like that was just mm-hmm. yesterday, but I don't I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was one of those times. Maybe they knew something was amiss because the door was locked from the inside oh. only. And so they, maybe they thought someone was hurt or... Oh, yeah, that's true. There was also, which I was going to get to later, so I may say this again if I don't forget that I already said it. There was the day before um, another couple that had reported some screams or sounds that sounded kind of suspicious to the front desk. But when they went to investigate, they didn't know what room it was coming from or anything. So they really couldn't, like, just, they weren't knocking on everybody's doors. They went to investigate. They didn't hear anything. So they just kind of were like, well, I guess it's fine. So maybe that was also part of why they were like, well, wait, there was that suspicious activity yesterday. Maybe we should check on them. Yeah. Aaron has a good point, though. If the door is locked from the inside, somebody's in there. Right. Yeah. And you and- know that from the outside if you can't unlock it with your master key. Exactly. Right. You know. Yeah, that's true. Very, very good points. So Betty was bludgeoned with a lamp. and then Oh, my asphyxiated. gosh. And next to her was Catherine who was asphyxiated and Stephanie was also beaten and asphyxiated. William was in the hallway with a fatal stab wound to the neck. So there you have it. Who killed these people? Upon further investigation, police believe William killed his family sometime Sunday late afternoon and then killed himself. The family had a meal at Miss Shirley's Cafe. I don't know where that is, but it sounds like a delightful place. And after that, some they had some like in-room movies that they had rented. Um, and this is where that comes in. Around 3.15, a noise complaint was made. But like I, get, I said, they couldn't investigate it because they really didn't find any evidence of it. And, so, and they didn't know where it was coming from. So it was believed that this was when William killed Betty and Catherine because Stephanie was still in her dorm room on campus studying for a chemistry test that she had the following day. And at some point, she went over to the hotel to see her family one last time because they were supposed to leave the next day. And when she arrived, William killed her in the same manner that he killed Betty. Stephanie's autopsy report showed that she had severe hand, elbow, and wrist bruising, which suggests that she put up some kind of struggle. And I can only imagine what was going through her mind because she's entering. Her mom and her sister were presumably already dead in the room. So she must have seen them as she entered. And then she's probably going to freak out because dad's just standing there like nothing happened essentially. So he must have had to fight her to keep her from running out of the room. Um, 
In the hotel room, they found a receipt timestamped 524 p.m. from Crate and Barrel, which was right across the street from the hotel, and it was for a knife. So it's believed that he oh. left the room to buy this knife to kill himself after he'd already done this to his family. Why does it he, make it so much more tragic that he went to Crate and Barrel? I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why did we have to know it's Crate and Barrel, by the way? But anyway. Because it makes it more tragic. It just does. I don't know why. I don't like that, William. <laughs> Should have just gone to like CVS or – Bring your own knife. How about Walgreens that? or something. Yeah. Grab, e grab a knife. Okay. And... <laughs> oh, my gosh. The autopsy report for him stated that, we're, that there were hesitation marks when he stabbed himself. Because I'm sure – I mean, and you have this plan, but you've – it must be hard to – I wouldn't know, but it must be hard to do that. Yeah. Um, as the investigation continues, the FBI raids William's Manhattan office in hopes to find some answers and because there had also recently been some complaints filed against him with a few clients. Not only was he an attorney, but he was running an investment business too. He had said that he was offering bridge loans, which um, maybe you guys know what those are, but I had – I had heard the term, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Um, but it's a short-term loan used for a person to, or a company to until they secure permanent financing, apparently. So it's like give them this little bit of money, charge them a big amount of um, interest until they can actually get a, a loan from like a bank or whatever. So William was doing this. He was taking money from investors, basically some of the clients that he works with, and using the money to offer bridge loans to people. And he was saying that his investors would get 12 to 20, 12 to 14 percent return on their investment. And my guess is that he was getting some sort of small percentage of that, you know, just for facilitating the loan. He had taken at least 12 million and possibly up to 35 million dollars over a 20 year period. And just before the murder suicide, a few of the investors had asked for their money back. They wanted to be paid in full plus their 12 to 14 percent return. And he sent a couple. First, he kind of balked at it, like, why do you want your money? But I think there was like another Ponzi scheme that was getting discovered during that time. And so they just kind of got a little weary about it. And so they were like, we just want our money back. Like, just give us our money. So he kind of balked at them for a little bit, but then he sent a couple of checks out. But those checks bounced. And that's when a couple of the clients started raising suspicion and filing complaints. And he had also been real vague about where the money was being invested, but no one questioned it because he was trusted. Like he was, had a good reputation. They knew him for years. And he never cursed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got, and he shopped at Great and Barrel. <laughs> Something about a guy that doesn't curse. It, curse. <laughs> In reality, no one knows where any of this money went. They literally have not uncovered any business associates or sketchy people that could have been involved. And when looking into his personal finances, they find that they basically only had $5,000 in the bank. He had an outstanding mortgage of $600,000 on that $1 million house. And he had taken out two mortgages on that count condo that um, appraised for $250,000, but he had two mortgages on it that equaled $500,000. And he still owed $11,000 on his car. Oh, and $37,000 approximately in credit card debt. So where's any of his money? I mean, he's a reputable tax attorney and he's got all these millions of dollars so where did any of it go because he wasn't paying anything off not even his own stuff so who knows so there's a huge fight over the estate because there's five million dollar life insurance policy that he had gotten two years prior and betty's side of the family was trying to contest it because he killed them but in the end the courts awarded it to william side of the family because in order for Betty to get it, she would have had to, or the girls would have had to survive him for at least a moment after he was dead. Mm. So, and which they didn't. <clears throat> and I didn't really follow up to see how it was dis dispersed because there was a lot of people looking to recoup their money at this point. So I didn't follow through with that. So it just seems like William was starting to feel the pressure of being found out and decided it was best to just end it all and take his family with him because that no is saw this coming. ridiculous. Why did he kill his children? Well, or his yeah. wife. But I mean, I feel like even the spouse is a little more understandable because she knows your secrets. So, right. Yeah, that's true. I did read an article at, like 
the, about another family who this was something similar happened in the same town actually. And so they were talking about all these studies that they had done and the men that do this, that kill their entire families and themselves, it's like they, they are over, they use the word enmeshed, which I had no idea what that meant, but it basically means you have no personal boundaries. Like you're like all one unit and you, it's like they're your personal property. And so if you're not going to be around to have them, nobody's going to have them or they can't survive without you. So why would you put them through that? And they don't even think about like, I'll just kill myself and let them live. They think that they couldn't live with this stigma. So it's like this psychological I'm surprised you don't understand it. <laughs> no, I do. I, but it's just interesting how somebody who, I mean, from what you're saying was a perfectly productive member of society with no mental illness that anybody is aware of. And then all of a sudden one day he's like this crazy narcissist mm -hmm. and kills his entire family and himself. Yeah. Over reputation, essentially. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not wanting Gross. to feel ashamed. Yep. So that was my family annihilator story. <laughs> It was the crate and barrel that got me. <laughs> I'm not going to forget that. I'm just not. <laughs> okay. So you got you got one for us too. I do. Do you want to talk about? Do you want to? Do you have anything to say about that? Amy? I know. Does anybody have anything? <laughs> I think this is why you don't trust people that don't cuss and drink. <laughs> right. For real. <laughs> Some, something's wrong. <laughs> I think that's what are you relying great on? advice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Perfectly wrap that up in a nice little <laughs> box. <laughs> Super here for that. <laughs> Let's put it on a shirt. Okay. <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> so my story is going to be about another family annihilator, but this family is called the Sarton family. And they were in Ohio. Oh, okay. Not too far from here. I don't feel like Ohio is far from anywhere. It's in the Midwest. That's true. <laughs> it's literally in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have it, either of you heard of the Sarton family? No. This happened a long time ago. This is an older story. I don't have a lot of detailed information on the backstories of like the patriarch and matriarch of the Sarton family because it's just older and obituaries back in the day were not like extra like they are now. So they didn't tell us a whole lot. I don't know. Like we really love obituaries <laughs> when we're covering cases because they just tell you a lot of information like where people worked and what their hobbies were and they just didn't have things like that back then. So bear with me. I'll tell you what I know. So the first guy I'm going to talk about is dad, Harold Edward Sarton. He was born in 1928 in Canada, Kentucky. At some point, I know, I've never heard of it. Mm -mm. At some point during his life, Harold moved to the Sandusky, Ohio area. Do you know where Sandusky, Ohio is? Yes. Actually, when you Emery moved to New York about it. <laughs> from Wisconsin, right before we got married, we met his mom and him and me and my dad met him and like picked him up and <laughs> kept on going to New York in Sandusky. Oh, it's like the roller ever... coaster capital of the world. Yes. I was going to say that. <laughs> and it, it also, have you ever seen the movie Tommy Boy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sandusky, Ohio. Yes. Greatest movie ever. Chris Farley. Super funny. Okay. That's all my knowledge of Sandusky, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Farley and roller coasters. So in Sandusky, Ohio, or in the area, is where he met a pretty lady by the name of Mary McNew. Now, Mary was born in 1938, and she was born in Maxie, Virginia. But at some point in her life, her family moved to the Ohio area and in the similar area that Harold lived, and that is where she met him, and they fell in love. And the two of them had a very quick romance and got married in 1957. At that time, Harold was 29 and Mary was only 19. So there's a 10-year age gap and it's in 1957. So I feel like if you just think about that, you have a pretty good idea of like what their life was like. 
You know, yeah. she's like this very young, pretty woman who has this man, older man. I mean, he's not older, but like 10 years older. He works. She doesn't. Mm-hmm. 1957. Right. So the two of them lived in Port Clinton, Ohio, which is right outside of Sandusky. And they lived there for about six years. And then in 1963, the couple moved from Port Clinton to Bayview, which is like 11 miles apart. So like they're just staying right and moving around that like Sandusky area. The Sartans bought a modest one-story home. And during their time together, they had five children. Oh, wow. Literally one right after the other. Like I'm talking two years or less between every kid. Five times. Mm. <laughs> yes. Five times. <laughs> and she, yeah, like I did it one time. So yeah. I, have, I have two that are really close together and that sucked. Mm. So um, their names were Rita, Harold Jr., Kenneth, David, and Brian. I will not remember mm. those names. Okay. <laughs> That's sad, okay? It's too many. Mary was a stay-at-home mom while Harold worked outside of the home. I don't know where he, what he did for a living, but I think it's very safe to say that he worked like a blue collar job in Ohio, but I don't know what it was. So pretty much right away after they moved to the Bayview area, neighbors and friends began noticing that the couple was having some like serious marital problems. When I say serious problems, I mean, it's reported that they would fight openly, like in front of everyone and would threaten to kill each other. Like oh murder each other, like I'm gonna slit your throat. You're an SOB. Isn't that what happens in everyone's marriages? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna say no. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> so they had a reputation for being very volatile and unhappy, and I mean. My kind of psycho. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> so eventually, Harold moved out of the house and began sleeping in a bed in their garage. Harold also began seeing another woman. Oh. This woman was from Sandusky, Ohio, and she had three children of her own. So she wasn't 10 years younger than him. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Got it. So by this time, it's 1965, and the couple had been married for eight years at this point. Harold was 37. Meryl, Mary was 27. And they had their five kids. They had Rita, who was six. Harold Jr. was five. Kenneth was three. David was two. And Brian was just seven months old. So they openly wanted to kill each other. <laughs> And argued about it all the time, apparently in the front yard. I don't know exactly, but that's how I picture it. Harold is having an affair and living in the garage. This so, is a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you know, the American dream. Now, <laughs> Harold decides to tell Mary about this other woman, the Sandusky woman. Mm, bad and news. he tells her, yes, it was. <laughs> and he tells her that he was in love with her and that he was leaving Mary and their children and going to Australia with what? his Sandusky boo thing. So he's like, Where did Australia come from? I don't know. I have so many questions for Harold. I don't know. <laughs> so he tells Mary that he will be getting his paycheck on August 13th. So this is 1965. And that he was going to give her his paycheck, but then he was out. So he's like, she was just on her own. She's just on her own. So he's like, I'm leaving you children. alone with five kids. That's right. Three of which are babies. Exactly. The oldest is six. She has five children, six and under. And he's like, I'm leaving. I'm going to Australia. I'm leaving you with these kids, but here's my paycheck. So you're good, right? How's he good? getting to Australia if he's giving the paycheck away? I don't know. Same dusky boot thing. I don't know. Not cheap to get to Australia. <laughs> I don't know where else. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, exactly. Dear Harold. Okay. <laughs> so August 12th was going to be their last day together. So apparently he told her this like in advance. Like and he's he was just like, expecting her to be like, okay, great. Yeah, I'll spend the last day with you and that's fine. We'll, cool. we'll have fun. Last night. <laughs> Let me make you dinner. Let me make you dinner, Harold. 
Okay. Mary is obviously very upset about this. And so she drives to Port Clinton, Ohio, where they used to live, and purchases a 32 caliber five shot pistol. And then she goes home. So, you know, she's like, kids, kids are at school. I'm going to buy a gun real quick. That night at around 1 a.m., Mary calls her neighbor, Mrs. Barnes. And she tells Mrs. Barnes that she is going to kill her family and then herself. It's 1 a.m. And she says, Harold is having an affair. He's leaving me like today and is with this Sandusky woman. And I'm going to kill them all. Including, she gonna, yeah. including herself. And, and was she going to kill the girlfriend too? Did she say that or just her family? She's she's, she's going to kill her husband. She's going to kill her family and herself. So the neighbor, Mrs. Barnes, she says, oh, Mary, you say that all the time. <laughs> oh, my God. She does. She oh, Mary. So many times. Oh, Mary. I'm going to go back to bed. Sweet dreams. Oh, gosh. So she says that she did not take Mary seriously because Mary was always getting mad about stuff and she was always flying off the handle. And both of them, both Mary and Harold, were known to do this. They were known to do crazy stuff. They were known to say crazy things. But Mary was serious. Hmm. So what happens next was put together based on evidence on what the investigators believe happened. Mm -hmm. Spoiler, because there was no survivors. Sometime between 2 and 3 a.m. on August 13th, Mary took her new gun and went into the garage where her husband Harold was sleeping and shot him three times in the head. It is believed that Harold was asleep and never woke up, so he like had no idea what was coming. He died instantly. Mm -hmm. She then returned into the house, and she got the baby, Brian, who was seven months old, and took him into the children's room and put him into the bed with his brother, David, who was two. The oldest children, Rita, Harold, and Kenneth, who were all six, five, and three, were sleeping in a bed together. And one at a time, oldest to youngest, she shot them each once in the head. Oh, my gosh. Man. She then turned to the two younger boys, the babies, the two-year-old and seven-month-old, and shot them both once in the head. She then, while she was standing in between both of the babies or both of the children's beds in the middle of the room, turned the gun on herself and shot herself in the head. And it is reported that she shot herself in the back of the head. How do you do that? Oh, that's well, super me. weird. I don't know. Yes. It's I, possible. I think it's possible for sure. But weird. Mm. So I think the part that I found most horrific about all of these reports is that, and they don't really talk about this, but I was just thinking about this. It was a five-shot pistol. I, I thought that when you first said it, that there was more than five people. In exactly. Room. So she had to reload. She shot a total of nine times. Oh, yeah. They know it. She times. shot all five kids. She shot him three times. And then she shot herself one time. So she had to reload. So if she had to reload that gun, those kids knew what was going on. They were awake. They probably saw siblings. Yeah. At least three of, right? I mean- at least three of them were awake because if she shot him five times and then the first two, she'd have she to shot reload. him three times. Right, three times, but then shot the first two kids. So mm -hmm. that's five. So that's then had five bullets. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that awful to think about? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's awful anyway, but to be aware and it be your mother and you like that be the last, like, no, Mary. Okay. So the next day, Harold, the husband, his sister had been trying to reach the two of them on the phone, like to make plans or whatever for something. And she wasn't able to. So she just stopped by. And when she went into the house, she actually discovered all seven of the bodies in the house and called the police. I cannot imagine. No. And could you imagine being Mrs. Barnes? Well, no. Oh, no. I mean, she's all right, but. I know, but still. Yeah. Yeah. She made, she made a bad choice. A real bad choice. <laughs> yeah. I don't care how many times somebody cries wolf. 
they call you in the morning, yes, one in the morning exactly. or whatever. Tell you Put it on a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always believe people when they talk about killing people. Okay. After the deaths, the post office turned over a letter to the police that had been picked up from the Sarton home the day of the family's deaths. So like on the 12th before she did all of this, Mary wrote a letter. The letter was addressed to the Sandusky woman that Harold had been planning to run away with. Mary tells the woman that she knows Harold wants to leave her and his children for this mistress and that she would rather keep the family united in death than to see them split up by divorce. She wrote, this is the way it has to be, and that she felt like the family, killing the family was the only way out. I mean, Australia is a way out, but okay. (laughs) And that she really hopes everyone will understand. We don't marry. Okay. She says that she had given her husband a good home and she'd taken good care of him, but even then her children still had to wear other people's clothes and they didn't always have enough food. So this mistress was really like barking up the wrong tree here. She didn't even pick a winner. And she says to the mistress that she hopes she was satisfied now and that she would leave other married men alone. Oh my gosh. This Mm -hmm. is like teaching her a lesson. Exactly. Yeah. She says that she wants her, this incident, the murder suicide to be on the front pages of all the newspapers. She said that in the letter. Did she get her wish? I hope she, not. Mary did get her wish, actually. It was in a lot of newspapers. One of the newspapers, the he- I'm not laughing, but one of the newspapers, um, articles that I read, the headline was, Woman Uses Gun to End Marital Troubles. <laughs> like the most insensitive headline ever. Yeah. Okay. But- Mm -hmm. So there was an interview with Mrs. Barnes after this incident happened, and she was obviously forever guilt-ridden because she completely ignored Mary's phone call about what she was planning. And interestingly, it did say in all of the articles that the family had a joint funeral service. So all of them, all seven of them, Mary included, Right. Had a joint funeral service and that they are all seven buried together in Harold's hometown of Canada, Kentucky. Hmm. That's strange that his family would want that. I think so, too. I mean, I know it was 1965 and like, I don't know, I guess you just kind of did what you had to do. But no. Yeah. No. For me, that's a no. Especially it was Harold's sister that found them. Right. Right. So you think Harold's sister, I I mean, I would be like, no. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And especially, yeah, once they realized that it was her that did it, you know, like, why, yeah. If they didn't know and they just thought that somebody came in randomly and killed them all. I think they knew pretty much right away that it was Mary. Well, Well, because she she wrote wrote a letter and told him. (laughs) She called Mrs. Barnes. Right. And she called Mrs. Barnes. I'm just saying, like, had that been the, like, the the outcome that they didn't know who killed this whole family. Right. Then it's a different story to bury them all or have a funeral together and whatnot. But and that is the story of the Sarton family annihilator. Wow. The scorned Mary Sarton. And so interesting that it was a woman mm-hmm. that killed her family. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever read profiles of family annihilators. I mean, you probably came across some in all your research and stuff, but mm-hmm. that is a super small percentage of yeah people that are women. Well, I think women murderers in generals is a much smaller percentage, isn't it? That's true. Yes. Men. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. But um, most of the time, family annihilators who are female, who like kill their children and stuff, it's religious based. And mm-hmm. almost like they'll say that they think that their children are possessed. I mean, those are the most popular mm-hmm. stories or that they are sat like the world is so the world is scary <laughs> <laughs> and people suck. And so they are saving them from yeah. a lifetime of whatever. That's like the typical women family annihilation. Yeah, there was the woman that drowned her children one by one in the bathtub, and that was her reasoning. 
Yeah. Something mm-hmm. along those lines is that she was saving, she was save, actually saving the children by yeah. killing them. Yeah. 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 So no, I mean, she wasn't even doing anything altruistic like that, you know, right. not that that's no. more understandable, but it's like, obviously those people have delusions. She right. was not delusional. Like she was like, she my was- husband is leaving me and mm-hmm. that sucks. And we all should die because that's she how bad it's pissed. Sucks. Yes. She, yeah. She was just really mad. It's gross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that's sad. It is. They were so little. Oh, I know that I, that hit me worse. I mean, I know both of our stories, the entire family dies and is killed by like the par- parental figure, but yours hit me different because it was like te- seven months old, like a what? baby. <sighs> and you know, she was suffering from postpartum depression. Like, I'm not saying she didn't have mental illness. She had had right. six children like in a minute and a half. So she was going through some stuff, I'm sure. And her husband was leaving her. She was very young. They probably had limited means. I'm sure there was all kinds of stressors going on. You know, she had been threatening to kill him for years. She was not right. (laughs) Things were not okay with Mary. So I'm sure she did have some mental illness. But yeah, she was just mad. Woman scorned. You can read the letter. Oh, I bet. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely in the newspapers. (laughs) Did they publish the letter in the newspaper? I saw one. Is that how you found it? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's weird to me. Isn't that gross? It's like a murder suicide letter. Really, in a way, to the kids, you know. The woman I, uses a gun to end marital troubles. <laughs> like, well, that's terrible. Well, yeah, she did, but good grief. I mean, don't you know? I feel like maybe even back then, like they I, they weren't thinking about things like that when they were like, we're going to publish this letter. Because there's like weird things that we have found in newspapers from like our old, older cases yes. that you're like, really? What? They published that? Like, what mm-hmm. did they put that in the yeah. Yeah. I couldn't find any obituaries for the kids or Harold or Mary. Hmm. Not really. I mean, they all just said like she was born on this day in this town and died in on this day in this town. So there wasn't like a whole, I mean, there just wasn't a lot of information. More like, a, like a death record instead of an obituary. I think, yes, exactly. It was more like that. So, hmm. yeah. So the information about them was really limited, but that is what I found. And it was crazy enough. So there you go. Yeah. No kidding. Gosh. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Appreciate it. Now I get to go to bed. <laughs> <Get back. laughs> oh, well, that was fun. And yeah, super fun to have Aaron around with us. Yes. To celebrate. Yeah, our thank birthday. you. I enjoyed it. Good. Did you have anything that you wanted to ask us, Aaron? Um... We're on the spot. Or anything you want to say about to the true crime community out there? Are you a big fan of true crime? Um, I watch a lot of true crime TV. This is the only podcast I listen to. Oh, wow. Um, I never really had even listened to podcasts until Christy started doing this one. Yeah. Woohoo. <laughs> we appreciate the support. It's the best one. I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. You heard it here. <laughs> Some people want us to be their parents. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that so that was a review we got. <laughs> oh, really? It's like Which we loved, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wish they were my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so well, nice. I don't know if you do, though. <laughs> I told my oldest that, too. I was like, somebody said in a review that they wish, or I just let him read the review, and he was like, he wishes you, that you were their parents, but you're my parent. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you want to trade? Do you want me to get her email address? I don't know. Work something out she for you. She can make us some hats. Didn't she say she's true? Hat? She said she's a hat stitcher. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, well, thanks for joining us for our anniversary episode, birthday episode, anniversary, mm-hmm. whatever we're going to call it. It's good to know. be one. We look so young. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Got anything else? Nothing. That's all I got. So you guys keep checking us out. Send us all your stuff and write us a review and tell us who you want us to be. (laughs) Cousin, aunt, uncle. No, we can't be uncles. (laughs) You know what? 
Yes, we can. <laughs> we could <do> whatever. <laughs> and join us next week for a more typical episode. And thank you so much, Aaron, for being such a loyal listener and supporting us. We love it. We're here for you and your beautiful hair. <laughs> and always remember the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet. <laughs>